Prince. But for 1,600 years, an important piece of landscape went missing, buried like a treasure in the sea, awaiting discovery. Cleopatra's Palace. thousand years a great civilization flourished here and left a dazzling legacy filled with images of wealth and worship power and pride the people who held the profound belief in the afterlife which found expression in enormous temples and tombs and vested their faith in the Pharaoh to lead them and protect them. Each pharaoh left an indelible mark. Ramses II, the great empire builder. And Tutankhamun, the boy king. But the most famous pharaoh all but vanished. face that launched a thousand legends. Her story begins in Alexandria, a city at the mouth of the Nile River on the Mediterranean coast. It was founded in 332 BC by Alexander the Great, who conquered Egypt for his ever-expanding empire. After Alexander's death, the city fell into the hands of his general, Ptolemy I who established Greek control over Egypt. Within a hundred years, Alexandria was the most famous city in the world, a glorious cultural and learning center which attracted the finest scholars and artists of the time. It grew rich as a trading port between Europe and Asia. Ships from India and Rome sought out its fabled lighthouse one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Greek occupation of Alexandria and the rest of Egypt lasted for some 300 years, until Cleopatra's time. Queen Cleopatra VII, an Egyptian pharaoh and a full-blooded Greek, she remains one of history's great enigmas. Popular among the Egyptians, Cleopatra was the first Greek ruler to learn their language. She kept the powerful Roman Empire at bay by forging intimate alliances with its leaders. But her luck ran out when Octavius, the ruler of Western Rome, decided to take Egypt from her grasp. Rather than submit to defeat, the queen committed suicide. For all the drama that Cleopatra endured, there's not a trace of it left in present-day Alexandria. Instead, her world lies hidden in 10 meters of murky water in a bay that spreads over two square kilometers. No one has ever attempted a full search of this enormous site until now. very long time I had a dream to come to this place because of the mystery of this site. For Frank Odio, 10 years of planning culminate in this year's expedition. A former financial advisor, he abandoned his successful career to pursue Cleopatra full-time. And this is where he hopes to find her. While exploring the sunken island of Antirodos, home of Cleopatra's legendary palace, his team of divers stumble across a piece of wood sticking out of the sediment. For three weeks, divers clear the site. Curiosity turns into excitement. Is the wreckage of an ancient ship 
more than 30 meters long. The big surprise for the team and me this season was the discovery of the wreck in the port of the island of Tyrodos. And it's a superb wreck and uh, it's a magnificent state of preservation. Radiocarbon dating places the vessel within Cleopatra's lifetime. sends artist Patrice Sandrin to sketch the large ship. Special waterproof paper allows him to draw an overview. Just transferring uh, the uh, measurement taken by Patrice at the bottom. Little by little, we see uh, the shape of the wreck and all the detail of the wreck. The type of construction will lead us to define when exactly this boat has been built and by who and for which purpose, which is also uh, very, very important in this case. Sandra's drawings and film of the wreckage are sent to Dr. Steve Vinson of the University of Chicago, an expert in ancient ships and shipping. A nice shipwreck is always a pleasant surprise. In fact, what they're swimming through is the very bottom of the ship, where all the muck and the gunk used to collect. Uh, this is down in steerage, basically. The computer model helps Dr. Vincent bring the ship back to life. Not every frame crosses the keel. It, it's more or less... Well, the drawing gave me the first clue because with the drawing I was able to see the whole thing in a glance. What we have is the center line, the keel, which is this well, heavy longitudinal member, comes from the front to the back. Crossing the keel are lots of pieces that go from side to side that you would call ribs or more properly called frames. The ship was large by ancient standards, 30 meters long with thick supporting beams that measure 8 meters from end to end. Vincent suspects it is a cargo ship. Well, if it was leaving Egypt, it may well have been carrying a cargo of grain. Estimates put the amount of grain shipped from Egypt to Rome at about 50,000 tons a year. A cargo ship this size? could carry 300 tons of grain or wine stored in tightly packed jars. The wealth of the Nile that made Cleopatra rich. Egypt was where a lot of luxury goods from China, from India or Sub-Saharan Africa would have been shipped through. Um, silks from China, spices from Arabia, incenses, perfumes um, from Africa, exotic animals, lions for devouring Christians uh, would have come through Egypt. Hidden between the timbers of the ship, Godio's team finds jewelry in pristine condition. some surprise with this wreck. First we found it and uh, the size of this boat is uh, quite impressive and uh, we have some very nice uh, luxury item, very good quality. This is a bottom of a cup, a very fine and beautiful cup. We have also found this hairpin, ivory hairpin and we found very cute uh, gold ring here. Very nice. And we have this uh, exquisite and important gold ring here, which is a, a gold ring with a semi-precious stone with an engraving of a crested bird called Integria. And it was used as a seal, for example. After weeks of cleaning the wreck site, divers find a large hole, the wound that sank the ship 2,000 years ago. But 
but there is no way to know if it struck a reef or was a casualty of war. It may take years to solve the mystery of the wreck in Cleopatra's harbor. It is one of the best preserved ancient ships ever found. A ship that Cleopatra may have watched sail by from her royal palace. The palace Frank Gotio is determined to find. years ago, Alexandria was the wealthiest city in the world, greater than Athens or Rome. Today, a humble fishing fleet has replaced Cleopatra's imperial navy. Somewhere in these waters, lie the palaces where she seduced the most powerful men on earth, the mighty Julius Caesar of Rome. Four centuries after Cleopatra's death, earthquakes and a huge tidal wave toppled the palaces on the harbor front. Scattering them into the bay, creating a massive underwater jigsaw puzzle. If anything remains of Cleopatra's palace, it would be found somewhere in the vast, featureless bay. Two to ten meters deep, the bay is over two square kilometers. Godio needs a starting point for his treasure hunt. His only guide is a faint voice from antiquity. tribe who journeyed to Alexandria three years after Cleopatra's downfall and chronicled the wonders that he saw. His name was Strabo and he described the sprawling walled city with a great lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. We know from uh, Strabo that all around this harbor, there were palaces and temples. Among them, there was also an island with the palace of Cleopatra and a small harbor belonging to the king. Many maps have been made based on Strabo's writings, but only underwater exploration can provide the missing details. Visibility is a problem. Divers can rarely see more than two meters through the murky waters, and the slightest storm churns up centuries of silt. To locate the palace, Godio's team uses a variety of sensors to detect the shape of the seafloor below. The harbor is scanned for changes to the Earth's magnetic field, indications that structures may lie buried there. The images are combined with sonar and depth soundings to produce a rough sketch of the submerged jetties and ancient ports. has assembled a multinational team of divers and archaeologists. Gotyu's team has eight weeks to find the palace before the torrid Egyptian summer turns the water into an impenetrable soup. At first, the divers have a hard time getting their bearings. Centuries of calcium deposits cover rocks and relics alike in nearly a meter of solid crust. By 
chipping away at that crust, the divers expose pieces of the ancient city's wealth and grandeur. A statue of the Greek god Hermes. A coiled serpent, guardian of the city. A sacred bird of Egypt. Gautio gives the divers a new piece of technology, known as the piano for its many black buttons. It helps divers establish their position by receiving signals from a global positioning satellite. But the satellite's data are only accurate within 50 meters. Gautio needs much greater precision. So he finds a modern solution in a medieval fortress. A transmitter is mounted in the turrets. Its signals will be used to improve the calibration of the piano underwater. This receiver uh, is linked to two antennas. The first one receives the signal from the satellite. And the second one receives a signal from our base, which is on the tower. The computer will link the two signals. Godio's system is 30 times more accurate than before. This is the first time the GPS system has been used in underwater archaeology. And it allows Godio and his team to establish the longitude and latitude of each location, accurate to within one and a half meters. The results of the GPS survey are astounding. Frank Godio is able to draw an accurate map of a vanished metropolis. In 1997 and 8, after archaeological excavation, we were able to precisely define the contour and location of the ruined city. Gaudio's team uses red buoys to make an outline of the sunken discoveries. Following Strabo's clues, Gaudio is now finally able to bring a lost world into view. scientific adventure. For the first time in nearly 2,000 years, Queen Cleopatra's royal palaces may receive new visitors. Having mapped the ancient port of Alexandria, Gaudio narrows his search to the sunken island of Antirodos. Mohammed and Mustafa, you could go and clean the hieroglyph. It was here, in 26 BC, that the geographer Strabo saw Cleopatra's luxurious summer home, four years after her death. But he provides no clue to where the palace stood. Now it's up to Godio and his divers to find it. Mm -hmm. 
an archaeological excavation, it's like a big puzzle. The very tiny information fill gaps. The site itself is enormous, 27 hectares, in water so murky that visibility is often limited to arm's length. When artifacts are found, they must be placed along a scale of time on which Cleopatra's life is but a brief moment. In this treasure house of history, artisans left precious clues, eight blocks inscribed with Egyptian hieroglyphs, a wealth of information for the modern scholars who can read them. Strips of flexible silicone are sent down to make copies of the text. a dedication to gods whose cult ended a thousand years before Cleopatra's birth. Other inscriptions are in Greek. A tablet honors an emperor who ruled two centuries after Cleopatra's death. Island, divers discover two long rows of wooden stakes. They are the foundation of an ancient jetty and a valuable clue. The age of the wood can be determined. It dates back from the 4th century BC uh, and 5th century BC. And this is very interesting. The jetty was here long before Cleopatra. It's an encouraging find. If it survived all those years, there's a chance Cleopatra's world also did. By the time Cleopatra assumed the throne, Antirodos was a thriving royal port, prime real estate for the palace of an ambitious beauty and her famous lovers. Elated by the discovery of the ancient docks, Goggio looks for traces of buildings from Cleopatra's reign. Across the harbor, divers have uncovered dozens of distinctly Greek columns. Cleopatra's ancestors came from Greece and they imported their style to Egypt. Sharp edges resemble columns found in Athens, but carved in native Egyptian granite. Stones that were placed at the top of the columns are decorated with traditional Egyptian symbols. colonnades, sheltering the queen and her entourage as they boarded their royal vessels. Anchored above Cleopatra's sunken island, Godio is following a trail described only by the ancient geographer Strabo in 27 BC. Your knows there was a palace on Antirodos Island. From here, the royal family could have looked out across the bustling harbor toward the great lighthouse. Gotio 
most divers have chipped away at encrusted ruins in the southwest corner of the sunken island. Now, their labor pays off. The divers discover a series of giant columns cut from red Egyptian granite. On the southwest tip of Antirodos Island, we found an accumulation of red granite columns fallen into the port. We counted 60 pieces. They are huge, over four feet in diameter. The ruptured columns cover 60 meters of the bay floor. Pottery beneath them suggests they fell during an earthquake centuries after Cleopatra's death. Paintings from the ancient world indicate that the columns might have acted as a ceremonial gateway to the island. The columns announced the majesty of their owner. Some were more than seven meters tall. A magnificent entrance, fit for a queen. Approaching sailors would have marveled at this grand entrance to the royal island. The gateway leads Godio to suspect that the palace is near the center of the island. But in his attempts to find it, Godio sometimes finds the unexpected. One day, I was diving alone on Enterodos Island, cleaning a granite block. I was hoping for a hint to indicate I was on the right track to discover the remains of Cleopatra's palace. The hieroglyphs on the block of stone reveal a coiled snake, reminding the explorer of the legendary serpent that ended the life of a 39-year-old queen. Even though it was not from the period of Cleopatra, I took it as a good omen for myself. The inscription reads, Eternal Life. Dozens of other blocks are soon found. discovery convinces the team that they are on the right path. Vast expanses of limestone pavement fit for a queen, 550 square meters all over the island, forming a series of grand esplanades. Still more toppled columns are found, columns that seem to form an ancient colonnade leading presumably to the palace. Godio suspects he is close to the palace, so he instructs his divers to dig a deep trench near the pavement. It's interesting because there are more than a meter twenty under the... Using a powerful dredge, the team probes the jumbled strata of the harbor floor, layers that stretch backward in time from modern Egypt to Imperial Rome. It takes the team three weeks to reach the layer they're most interested in. The divers bring up a few surviving traces. This layer that we found yesterday with this very fine ceramic date, uh, we think, from the, uh, the time of Cleopatra. Godio and American archaeologist Emily Tita examined the artifacts. Pots and cups that may have been used by Cleopatra and her royal court. A miniature oil burning lamp. This is super. Now, this is quite different than what you've been finding before. It's in perfect condition. Meanwhile, another team of divers has made a remarkable discovery. Where the pavement ends abruptly, huge stone blocks appear. Unsure of the block's purpose, 
Gojo decides to dig around them to see if there are signs of something important. A palace, of course, it's an important monument, and for this important monument, you need very strong foundation. Gotio's divers begin to dig down through the centuries. A series of wooden foundations appear, marking the outline of a structure 62 meters long, large enough to support the construction blocks the team has found earlier. Gotio is convinced this must be the foundation of Cleopatra's palace. The dating of the wood indicates this structure was built 200 years before Cleopatra's birth. Gaudio believes this is a palace Cleopatra inherited as queen. this palace when Julius Caesar came to Alexandria or later on uh, Mark Antony, of course. Classical art offers hints of the palace's appearance. Tall Greek columns erected in Egyptian soil. Billowing canopies providing shade for royalty. But what did the palace really look like? Based on the foundations, experts can now hazard a guess. Inside these walls, ivory clothed the entrance wall. An Indian tortoise shell was inlaid upon the doors. The palace was adorned with many an emerald. Jewels glittered on the couches. It was here, 2,000 years ago, that the queen of a once great nation tried to save her people from conquest. Cleopatra's love affairs with Julius Caesar and Mark Antony have become enduring legends. Two great warriors entranced by a royal beauty and dazzled by the wealth of her dynasty. I feel privileged to be able to touch pavement on which once Cleopatra walked. Gaudio has found the main building of Cleopatra's palace complex, but he knows that his search of the island is not over. His divers have discovered something unusual nearby, something that would take everyone by surprise. Found the sunken island where Cleopatra ruled as queen, Frank Godio is looking for one more building. A shrine belonging to Cleopatra, her own personal temple. have spent two years searching for it. Gaudio is convinced it's still there. For the Egyptians, what mattered was the life after death. Only the temples were built to last to eternity, not the palaces. of kilometers to the south still heralds Cleopatra's immortality. Here, her image merges with the goddess Isis.
showed the power of fertility. Women begged her blessings for their children. She controlled the annual flood of the Nile that was essential for a successful harvest. For millions of worshippers in Egypt and throughout the Roman Empire, Cleopatra was Isis. In religious processions, Queen Cleopatra dressed as the goddess herself. What was left then of her personal shrine? Divers search an area of the sunken island near its shore. is found, but its identity is not immediately clear. It will head to the surface for further inspection. To raise the statue, Godio and engineer Jean-Jacques Groussard prepare a slow and careful hoist to prevent the statue from being smashed to pieces on the jagged paving stones below. Not very clear what yes. it could be. But yes, from my opinion... Gaudio is joined by Ibrahim Darwish, Egyptian director of the Department of Underwater Archaeology and archaeologist Emily Tita. The most likely thing, it's from a small sanctuary of the god, and this would be the major focus within the temple. Yeah. yeah the most probable thing is a priest, yeah. great priest, bearing canopus. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a master. Yeah. It is a high priest of Cleopatra's cult of Isis. He holds a jar called the Canopus, filled with holy water from the sacred Nile. It is a priceless discovery, the first complete Canopus statue ever found in Egypt. The figure's bald head identifies him as a priest of the Isis cult, his entire body shaven for purity every three days, in preparation to pray to the goddess to ensure the fertility of the Nile. But something even more spectacular waits in the water. Two perfect sphinxes. faces bear the likeness of Egypt's kings and queens, perhaps even Cleopatra herself. Frank Godio orders both sphinxes to be lifted aboard so that full casts can be made. For 2,000 years, the sphinxes have been hidden from human sight. Now, for a few agonizing minutes, they spiral towards the sky. When amazed, is the face. Yeah. The preservation yeah. of the face has not been armored. Yeah. It has been destroyed by nature. There's no inscription, unfortunately, but stylistically, this would be fairly easy to date because of the roundness of the face, the shoulder patches. Very nice. For the divers, after months of searching in the muddy darkness, it is a moment of joy. Each sphinx is prepared for a silicon molding. Petroleum jelly is applied to lubricate the surface. Life-size casts will be sent to classical scholars, 
to help solve the riddle of the Sphinx. on Antirodos Island, I have the chance to bring new information to light, such as the Sphinx bearing her father's likeness. During Cleopatra's reign, Sphinxes were often used as spiritual guardians for temples. The discovery of the Sphinxes so close to the Canopus priest suggests to Godio that he has found the shrine he was looking for. These were lying on a beautifully paved area near the red granite columns. This layout most probably shows that this was a small sanctuary of Physes close to the palace. 2,000 years ago, it would have been enclosed in sacred gardens instead of the sea. Isis transformed into human flesh. Cleopatra would have led processions here. Holy rituals blessed by the Isis priests, purified by sacred Nile waters from the Canopus jars. In the final hours of the expedition, there is one last treasure that must be resurrected from Cleopatra's harbor. It is a giant stone head. The complete statue must have stood at least five meters tall. But what man deserved such a memorial? There is only one way to be certain. Bring it to the surface for study. Godio immediately recognizes the face. It is the Roman dictator Octavius, Cleopatra's mortal foe. As his mighty army invades Alexandria, Cleopatra chooses suicide over surrender. She is Egypt's last queen, and now a mighty Roman claims her realm. After 2,000 years, Frank Godio has touched her world. As they prepare to sail home, Godio's team has one last task. They must return all of Cleopatra's treasures back to the bay. Ultimately, the Egyptian government will determine their fate. ago, I decided to undertake this important project, trying to find some remains of the submerged city of Alexandria. What he has found opens a new chapter in Egyptian archaeology and casts new light on a legendary queen the world cannot forget. Of the wreck in Cleopatra's harbor. It is one of the best preserved ancient ships ever found. A ship that Cleopatra may have watched sail by from her royal palace. The palace Frank Gotio is determined to find. years ago, Alexandria was the wealthiest city in the world, greater than Athens or Rome. Today, the humble 
fishing fleet has replaced Cleopatra's Imperial Navy. Somewhere in these waters lie the palaces where she seduced the most powerful men on earth, the mighty Julius Caesar of Rome. Alexandria. Four centuries after Cleopatra's death, earthquakes and a huge tidal wave toppled the palaces on the harbor front. Scattering them into the bay, creating a massive underwater jigsaw puzzle. If anything remains of Cleopatra's palace, it would be found somewhere in the vast, featureless bay. Two to ten meters deep, the bay is over two square kilometers. Godio needs a starting point for his treasure hunt. His only guide is a faint voice from antiquity. tribe who journeyed to Alexandria three years after Cleopatra's downfall and chronicled the wonders that he saw. His name was Strabo and he described a sprawling walled city with a great lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. We know from uh, Strabo that all around this harbor there were palaces and temples. Among them there was also an island with the palace of Cleopatra and a small harbor belonging to the king. Many maps have been made based on Strabo's writings, but only underwater exploration can provide the missing details. In committed suicide. For all the drama that Cleopatra endured, there's not a trace of it left in present-day Alexandria. Instead, her world lies hidden in 10 meters of murky water in a bay that spreads over two square kilometers. No one has ever attempted a full search of this enormous site until now. very long time I had a dream to come to this place because of the mystery of this site. For Frank Godio, 10 years of planning culminate in this year's expedition. A former financial advisor, he abandoned his successful career to pursue Cleopatra full-time. And this is where he hopes to find her. While exploring the sunken island of Antirodos, home of Cleopatra's legendary palace, his team of divers stumble across a piece of wood sticking out of the sediment. For three weeks, divers clear the site. Curiosity turns into excitement. the wreckage of an ancient ship more than 30 meters long. The big surprise for the team and me this season was the discovery of the wreck in the port of the island of Tyrodos. And it's a superb wreck and uh, it's in magnificent state of preservation. Radiocarbon dating places the vessel within Cleopatra's lifetime. Godio sends artist Patrice Sandrin to sketch the large ship.
Special waterproof paper allows him to draw an overview. We are just transferring uh, the uh, measurement taken by Patrice at the bottom. Little by little, we see uh, the shape of the wreck and all the details of the wreck. The type of construction will lead us to define when exactly this boat has been built and by who and for which purpose, which is also uh, very, very important in this case. Sandra's drawings and film of the wreckage are sent to Dr. Steve Vinson of the University of Chicago, an expert in ancient ships and shippings. A nice shipwreck is always a place. But for 1,600 years, an important piece of landscape went missing, buried like a treasure in the sea, awaiting discovery. Cleopatra's palace. Five thousand years, a great civilization flourished here and left a dazzling legacy filled with images of wealth and worship, power and pride. The people who held the profound belief in the afterlife, which found expression in enormous temples and tombs, and vested their faith in the pharaoh to lead them and protect them. Each pharaoh left an indelible mark. Ramses II, the great empire builder. And Tutankhamun, the boy king. But the most famous pharaoh all but vanished. face that launched a thousand legends. Her story begins in Alexandria, a city at the mouth of the Nile River on the Mediterranean coast. It was founded in 332 BC by Alexander the Great, who conquered Egypt for his ever-expanding empire. After Alexander's death, the city fell into the hands of his general, Ptolemy I, who established Greek control over Egypt. Within a hundred years, Alexandria was the most famous city in the world, a glorious cultural and learning center which attracted the finest scholars and artists of the time. It grew rich as a trading port between Europe and Asia. Ships from India and Rome sought out its fabled lighthouse one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Greek occupation of Alexandria and the rest of Egypt lasted for some 300 years, until Cleopatra's time. Queen Cleopatra VII, an Egyptian pharaoh and a full-blooded Greek, she remains one of history's great enigmas. Popular among the Egyptians, Cleopatra was the first Greek ruler to learn their language. She kept the powerful Roman Empire at bay by forging intimate alliances with its leaders. But her luck ran out when Octavius, the ruler of Western Rome, decided to take Egypt from her grasp. Rather than submit to defeat, the queen wasn't surprised. In fact, what they're swimming through is the very bottom of the ship, where all the muck and the gunk used to collect. Uh, this is down in steerage, basically. A computer model helps Dr. Vincent bring the ship back to life. Not every frame crosses the keel. It, it's more or less... Well, the drawing gave me the first clue, because with the drawing, I was able to see the whole thing in a glance. What we have is the center line, the keel, which is this well, heavy longitudinal member comes from the front to the back. Crossing the keel are lots of pieces that go from side to side that you would call ribs or more properly called frames. The ship was large by ancient standards, 
30 meters long with thick supporting beams that measure 8 meters from end to end. Vincent suspects it is a cargo ship. Well, if it was leaving Egypt, it may well have been carrying a cargo of grain. Estimates put the amount of grain shipped from Egypt to Rome at about 50,000 tons a year. A cargo ship this size could carry 300 tons of grain or wine stored in tightly packed jars. The wealth of the Nile that made Cleopatra rich. Egypt was where a lot of luxury goods from China, from India, or Sub-Saharan Africa would have been shipped through. Um, silks from China, spices from Arabia, incenses, perfumes um, from Africa, exotic animals, lions for devouring Christians, uh, would have come through Egypt. Hidden between the timbers of the ship, Gaudio's team finds jewelry in pristine condition. some surprise with this wreck. First we found it and uh, the size of this boat is uh, quite impressive and uh, we have some very nice uh, luxury item, very good quality. This is a bottom of a cup, a very fine and beautiful cup. We have also found this hairpin, ivory hairpin and we found very cute uh, gold ring here. Very nice. And we have this uh, exquisite and important gold ring here, which is a, a gold ring with a semi precious stone with an engraving of a crested bird called Integria. And it was used as a seal, for example. After weeks of cleaning the wreck site, divers find a large hole, the wound that sank the ship 2,000 years ago. But there is no way to know if it struck a reef or was a casualty of war. It may take years to solve the mystery. Visibility is a problem. Divers can rarely see more than two meters through the murky waters, and the slightest storm churns up centuries of silt. To locate the palace, Godio's team uses a variety of sensors to detect the shape of the seafloor below. The harbor is scanned for changes to the Earth's magnetic field, indications that structures may lie buried there. The images are combined with sonar and depth soundings to produce a rough sketch of the submerged jetties and ancient ports. has assembled a multinational team of divers and archaeologists. Gautio's team has eight weeks to find the palace before the torrid Egyptian summer turns the water into an impenetrable soup. At first, the divers have a hard time getting their bearings. Centuries of calcium deposits cover rocks and relics alike in nearly a meter of solid crust. at that crust, the divers expose pieces of the ancient city's wealth and grandeur. A statue of the Greek god Hermes. A coiled serpent, guardian of the city. The sacred bird of Egypt. Gaudio gives the divers a new piece of technology, known as the piano for its many black buttons. It helps divers establish their position by receiving signals from a global positioning satellite, 
But the satellite's data are only accurate within 50 meters. Goggio needs much greater precision. So he finds a modern solution in a medieval fortress. A transmitter is mounted in the turrets. Its signals will be used to improve the calibration of the piano underwater. This receiver uh, is linked to two antennas. The first one receives the signal from the satellite. And the second one receives a signal from our base, which is on the tower. The computer will link the two signals.